So I'd like to now show you a, a different way of looking at this boiling point elevation to lead into the other change. Let me go in here. All right, so let's look at vaporization. Or boiling. And from an enthalpy standpoint. And we've got the gas phase up here and the liquid phase up here. And what's important to know that at this point, this liquid refers to the pure solvent. And if you want to boil the liquid, you have to provide this much energy. But the enthalpy or the energy of the solution is a little bit less. But when you boil the solution, you get the pure solvent gas. But to do that, you have to give it this much energy. And so there's a larger gap, which means you have to, um, a higher temperature is needed to supply that energy. And so we say that the boiling point is elevated um, because uh, you'll need a higher temperature to provide that increased energy. Now let's look at how this is going to work for freezing. Now again, so here it's a little bit different. Or actually, yeah, let's do that. So we start with pure solid, and again, remember this here in this case is the solvent. And liquid, let's say it can here, the pure solvent. And if you want to melt it, you need to give it this much energy, this much heat. But remember the solution is at a lower energy. Let's say it is here. Well, in this case, to go from the solid to the, in this case, liquid solution phase, you only have to give it this much energy. So you actually have a lower gap, which means less energy needed, which means it can occur at a lower temperature. So the freezing point of the solution is lower. In other words, the freezing point has been depressed. And this process is called the freezing point depression.
So here I've got our generic um, phase diagram, so don't forget what's what where. So this would be the solid region. This is the gaseous region, and this is the liquid in the middle. And now we can actually add a different set of phase boundaries now for where the solution solid and the solution gas phase transitions would be. Now that we know um, how they are affected, and so this would be the new solution gas phase boundary, and here is the new solution solid boundary. And so here you can see, get some lines going here, that you know at a particular pressure, the liquid to get the solution to gas transition happens at a higher temperature than the liquid to gas transition. So again, this is at the boiling point elevation. But over here, and this always amazed me that this effect went in the opposite direction. It didn't always increase the phase transition temperature or didn't always decrease. It specifically increased the boiling point. But here, if you're looking at the temperature at which something freezes, right? So here's the temperature where the pure liquid, pure solid phase transition is. And here's the temperature where the pure solid solution phase, tra phase transi transition is. And that freezing point has been depressed. It's lower. And this expanded phase diagram here kind of has the whole thing pointed out and also talks about, I guess, just the melting point and the boiling point transition. And so here are a couple of, here are the bullet points that you need to be aware of. So again, number one, keep in mind, so, you know, for a non-volatile solid, so these are like basically solids. Um, you know, if you have a solution with a solid solute, when it freezes, the solid that forms is pure solvent. When it boils, the vapor is also pure solvent. Um, the energetics change, which means it changes the temperature pressure combinations where they're at equilibrium. The freezing point is lowered relative to that of the pure liquid. The boiling point is elevated relative to the pure liquid solvent. And here's the important thing, the magnitude of this change um, depends on the total solute concentration. Not what it is, only how much there is in there. And here's the math. So um, the freezing point depression, for example, so the change in the freezing point is equal to this thing called the cryoscopic constant, Kf, times the molal concentration, not molarity, molality concentration of the solute, and then times this Van Hoff factor, I. So what this factor is, is it takes into account that um, when certain things dissociate, dissolve, they might break up into more than one thing. And what matters for the magnitude of this change in the freezing point, for example, is the total concentration of stuff in there. And so how do you figure out what this Van Hoff factor is? Well, it's pretty straightforward. So what you need to understand is, so for something like sodium chloride, when it dissociates, it forms a aqueous sodium cation and an aqueous chloride cation. So you have one thing here, but it breaks up into two. So its Van Hoff factor is two. Calcium chloride um, breaks up into three particles, a calcium ion and two chlorides. So its Van Hoff factor is not two, it is in fact three. And finally, most covalent solutes like sucrose, table sugar, 
of don't break apart any further. So their Van Hoff factor is just one. And remember, molality is moles of the solute divided by the kilograms of the solvent, not the solution, solvent, kind of key there.